Hello, and welcome to our second panel event on World EV Day. How social media can be used as a tool for accelerating EV awareness and adoption. I'm Anita Fox, and having previously headed up marketing teams at Volvo and JLR, I've been leading Facebook UK's automotive division for the past seven years. I'm delighted to welcome you all today to this really exciting panel event, one of three events the EV Summit online series is hosting on World EV Day. Now, World EV Day itself is primarily a social media campaign, which last year achieved an inaugural aggregate audience of 1.9 billion people. We know how important social media is to influence opinion and drive change. And today I'm going to be talking to a panel of fellow experts to discuss the best ways to harness the power of social media to accelerate EV awareness and adoption. Now, before I share Facebook's insights into ways to motivate consumers, let me say a huge thank you to ABB, our proud headline partner again in our second year. So over the past 18 months, Facebook has conducted qualitative and quantitative research into consumers' motivations and barriers to purchasing an electric car. We're finding that most, most new car buyers are extremely confused about switching to electric, and there are just not enough people seriously considering an EV for the industry to hit its targets. So not only do car brands need to continue to lure considerers, they actually need to start convincing people who are still sitting on the fence that now is the right time to buy an electric car. There's been a swarm of new EV TV ads on at the moment, telling consumers the future is electric or you can power your world. And this is creating mass awareness of the amount of choice of new models that are now available. However, these ads don't really help people overcome the anxiety and functional concerns for purchasing one at the, you know, the feedback that we got from our ongoing consumer research. When you also consider there's 8 million people in the UK that no longer watch commercial television, and for the first time ever, under 55 year olds spend more of their media day on their mobile phones than watching commercial television. So that's why this panel is here today to discuss how social media like Facebook can be used as a tool, not just to drive awareness, but importantly, help shift consideration and ultimately drive greater adoption of EVs and sustainable mobility. Now our Facebook studies uncovered there's an evangelicist society of electric owners. What unites these evangelists is an overwhelming smugness that they're saving money on fuel. They've easily adapted their behaviors to new filling routines. Their car is delivering beyond their expectations when it comes to how it drives. Because they're experiencing this unrivaled performance that we know you get from electric, and this is coupled with this new sense of calmness and quietness, a sense of well-being, and an experience of a serene drive. One in which they can hear their phone calls and their in-car entertainment much more clearly. And then finally, we see that they relish this new status of modernity because they've been motivated by buying the latest cool technology. And we observe that there's just not enough advertising demonstrating or highlighting these benefits to consumers. Advertising is typically obsessed with features. And to be frank, in our research, we found that these features and messages are quite meaningless, or at worst, actually quite confusing to some customers. So I'm just gonna take you through four ways that social media, like Facebook's family of apps, is helping brands educate car consumers for the future and really start to overcome this consumer anxiety. So Hyundai in France created a mini series of six short films. And by sharing this video campaign on Facebook and Instagram, Hyundai France reached nearly 10 million potential car owners, addressing six common misconceptions. The cost of EV versus ICE, range anxiety and availability of chargers, charging times, recycling of batteries, all the way through to driving pleasure and experience. And people who viewed the series were then shown lead ads, inviting them to book a test drive. This campaign halved the cost per lead by cleverly overcoming objections to reject. Secondly, fuel savings and the total cost of ownership is a really hard um, thing to explain. And our research has shown that 45% of consumers want to save money on fuel. But many people are put off by the initial high cost to switch from ICE to EV. And we help Mini UK create interactive ads where consumers can see for themselves how much money they could save on fuel. People spent on average 39 seconds interacting with the calculator, making it far more engaging than a mobile standard ad. And 30% of them click through to the website. 
So by surfacing interactive content that's often buried deep on car brands' websites, brands like Mini are able to influence millions of potential car buyers much earlier on in their consideration phase. Thirdly, we saw how customers evangelize about their car ownership experiences. And we've seen a doubling this year of the amount of Facebook groups filled with people talking about electric cars. We also learned that considerers trust what existing owners tell them over automotive press, car websites, and even their family and friends. So we helped a car brand pioneer peer-to-peer -peer marketing by connecting considerers of their electric model with existing owners via a messaging bot. They ran adverts on Facebook that encouraged people to click to chat to an owner. And car buyers spent on average 12 minutes in messenger chat talking to an owner. 29% of those converted to a lead. And the last thought I wanted to share is that we know 40% of people buying a car check out the Facebook page of the retailer to see other people's experiences. We strongly recommend to dealers and retailers to treat their existing owners like VIPs, not only encouraging them to leave reviews on the service levels of the dealership, but now start to talk about their experiences owning and living with an EV, as this can definitely help convince others. We also recommend them activating messenger chats on WhatsApp because this provides customers with a really safe environment to ask simple, basic questions about EVs that they have without losing face when they walk into a showroom setting. So finally, with, 50, uh, with 43 million people in the UK using the Facebook family of apps, we can start to help brands not just reach 78% of all adults, but we can start to educate them on their switch to their EV journey. So. Our panel sponsor for this social panel is Green TV Media, a multi-channel publishing network and digital platform that specializes in telling and propelling sustainability stories that connect people with purpose. With a vision for change, for good, for all, the Oxford-based company creates content and channels, both digital and live, to bring audiences across the globe closer to messages. With the purpose of creating a better and decarbonized future, Green TV Media created today's World EV Day, the EV Summit and the E-Bike Summit. And their Electric Drives Facebook channel is the largest e-mobility channel outside the automotive industry with 250,000 followers. Now I'm excited to introduce today's lineup of influential names in automotive and sustainability-based communications, experts who are spreading awareness of e-mobility projects. And as representatives from global social media companies and prolific voices on sustainability, my guests will provide an insider's perspective on online sustainability-based communications. So today we have Dean Prosser, Head of Digital Communications at Green, um, at Green TV, Jack Carter, Automotive and Energy Lead at TikTok. Now following Jack, we're gonna be quickly pausing because we've got a super exciting short video address coming straight from the White House. Um, what a break. And then within a minute, we'll be back to hear from Michelle Davis, who's Head of Automotive at LinkedIn, before passing the mic to Laura McNally, Head of the Social at Autotrader. We have an opportunity for live Q&A with all these fantastic speakers. So please do share your questions for them in the Q&A tab throughout the event. And now to introduce our panel sponsor, Dean Prosa, Head of Digital Communications at Green TV and World EV Day. Dean has led multiple marketing and creative campaigns within the automotive sector from car brands like Nissan, Hyundai and Polestar through to charging infrastructure brands like Shell, Recharge and BP. So please start to send in your questions for Dean using the Q&A tab. Dean, thank you for joining us today. I'm sure you've got so much insight to share with us, so please do kick off. Hello, everyone. So first of all, I want to start by thanking all of our other panelists for joining us here and joining us in our celebrations of World EV Day. Each one of us here today are able to share a very unique insight on how social can be used as that tool to increase electric vehicle adoption, something that we all need to be thinking about in the coming months and years. This is something Green TV has been championing and working towards for many years now, working with multiple charging infrastructure and car companies on various electric car vehicle campaigns, spreading the good word of EVs. This, re this year, we re-released the Go EV pledge, allowing everybody to sign up to say their next vehicle will be electric. This year, it's not just about the EV enthusiasts and the evan evangel evangelicalists. We're bringing everybody on the journey with us. Last year, we created the very first World EV Day, 
our founder A. Thomas wanted to create a digital platform that would propel engagement and education around sustainable mobility at a time when the only tool we had at our disposal was digital and social. Deploying content from organizations, government bodies, NGOs, and most importantly, the EV driver. We're proud to say that during the first World EV Day, we reached a global audience of 1.9 billion. And this year, hopefully your timelines have already been flooded with all of the great news, product launches and announcements companies around the world are making to mark the day. But why is this day so important? Our key themes for this year's World EV Day are diversity, accessibility and education. And we believe these are the three pillars that will make sure the gear, the gear shift to electric is as frictionless as possible. Firstly, diversity and accessibility. When looking around at car campaigns, we're struck by a sea of white middle-class suburban families, something we believe fundamentally has to change. When we produce campaigns for clients using stock footage and imagery, it's extremely difficult to find people of color and people with any additional needs. And if we're the ones struggling to find that, and we're looking very hard, it means that any audience that doesn't fit into that mold are seeing even less so. So why would they be interested in making that change when they can't see themselves in that car? Getting a global audience behind the movement and sending us their user-generated content gives us the ability to shine a light on every walk of life and show that every car is for every person. And that is why we created World EV Day. Our team at Green TV come from very different backgrounds, walks of life, and I'm proud to say when it comes to gender, I'm in the minority, as the majority of our team are female. And then secondly, on to education. For years now, there have been multiple myths around electric vehicles. When I first told my dad that I'd be making the switch, his immediate questions were, but there are no charge points around, where are you gonna charge it? And the range isn't that good though, is it? You're gonna have to stop about three times on your way to, like before you see us. For those of us that work in the industry, we know that that simply isn't the case, but there is a lot of work to do to get the word out there to educate the masses. So how can we make that change? First and foremost, whenever we work with a company, we make it very clear that diversity and inclusion are baked into every single thing that we do. We've had the pleasure to create various campaigns, working with people from diverse backgrounds, making real world content that our audiences can relate with and to, but this number is in no way big enough. For every campaign that features that white middle-class suburban family, there needs to be 10 others featuring people from other walks of life. From working on various projects, we know one of the strongest way to get buy-in from customers is other customers. In this social savvy age, people don't believe what customers are trying to sell to them, especially when they already believe some of those myths. Using our channels like Green TV, Electric Drives and World EV Day, we've created a host of content from real world EV drivers that doesn't have a sales message behind it, but does explain what the car is like to drive, how it fits into their life, and gives a very honest view of range, charge time and price. We've also been fortunate to work with big companies changing the charging infrastructure landscape across the globe. Big glossy ad campaigns don't work when people are looking for their nearest charge point before purchasing an EV, but social does. Community groups and targeted advertising can be the perfect way to make sure nobody gets left behind. We may have to start thinking smaller to change the bigger picture. I wanted to use the platform here today to urge all companies and marketing agencies across social platforms that use social as a way to engage their audience to really think about the adoption and uptake for every person. Because to make the change to a more sustainable future, every person needs to get behind it. And that only happens when diverse people in diverse companies commission more diverse content. Thank you. Dean, that was fascinating. And I couldn't agree more with you about your points on diversity. It's something my team are extremely passionate about. And I think it's something social media has got a good opportunity to correct. Um, so I'm going to go straight to one of the first questions we've got for you. Um, the question says, Green TV works across most of the major social channels. What are the main challenges that you've experienced in promoting EVs? I think for us, one of the main challenges is just making sure that message is really bespoke for each platform. Um, a one size does not fit all kind of for each platform. And we know we're targeting very different markets. So for example, on LinkedIn, we're looking at more of a B2B audience and looking at more kind of fleet sales and things like that. Where for Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, it is a lot more B2C, which is you know where we're trying to put these kind of social video content out so that people can see themselves in those vehicles. Fantastic, thank you. And I've got another question here moving on from that. How have you seen different companies use social media to drive awareness? And a bit of a follow on from that, are there, um, there are many startups and young companies just starting out on social media. So there's a question to you about what advice would you give them? 
Um, I think a, a lot of companies that we work with are now starting to kind of break away from that cookie cutter shape of what an advert looks like and making it very glossy and are now trying to use social in the ways that I've kind of explained before of making those videos that are more personal that people can relate to. I think with a lot of the bigger companies we work with, as the same as any big company, it takes a lot of time to kind of get something put through. And, you know, with all the kind of red tape, these changes are small. So my advice for these startups are go for it. If you can do these kind of things that, you know, everyone is trying to do in the next three years, get ahead of the curve now. And here we go, I think we've got time for a couple more. So how do you reach people who don't know anything about EV? Often companies are preaching to the converted. Would you agree with that comment? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something like you mentioned as well with Facebook is a lot of a lot of people that own an EV and just want to kind of shout about how great it is. But I think we every kind of content piece that we make looks at kind of every side of it. And, you know, not saying that this, you know, this specific car is going to be perfect for you. We're looking more at, you know, let's find the right thing for you and, you know, how it fits into your life. So that's how kind of we position most of our content is just making sure we're finding the right car for the right person. And I think that's such a great, great question, because as an industry, we've got a job to tell everybody. I think sometimes car brands get a bit focused on the immediate sales. So everything gets a bit narrow in the targeting and people want to just talk to people that they think are in market. But we've got a whole education job to do. So going as broad as possible, educating as many people as possible is, is really the way to go. Um, and if we've still got time, let's just try to squeeze another one in because uh, these are great questions. What can companies um, in the mobility space do to cut through the myths and misconceptions that start to circulate online? I think it's just keep keep that message going. Um, I think saying it once isn't enough. We have to keep saying it and saying it in as many different ways as possible on as many different channels as possible. Um, getting people included, I think today is a perfect example of that. Like we've seen lots of different companies coming out with, you know, there's still a range anxiety myth that is going around and, and we just know that isn't the case anymore. But I think people just need to keep hammering that message home and eventually it will start to break through. Such, such valid points. Uh, well, Dean, so lovely to talk to you just now. Um, we're going to come back to you later on the wider panel, but for now, thank you for your great thoughts and insights. Um, we're going to move over next to Jack Carter. Um, now, Jack is Automotive Brand Partnerships Lead in the UK for TikTok. Um, Jack professes to have a passion for anything with four wheels and an engine. Um, previously, Jack worked at Audi's creative agency, BBH. Jack, I'm so interested to hear your take on EV um, and today's EV World Day. Lovely. Thanks very much, Anita, and great to be here. Thank you for having me uh, on Wild EV Day and uh, alongside my fellow panellists. So, yeah, yeah, I've kind of been thinking about this for a while because it's, um, you know, it clearly EV is a very pertinent subject. It's, it's no longer the buzzword of the industry. It's, it's the only uh, word of the industry. Um, and, and so there's many things at play and I think lots of things to be considering. But EV adoption is a long process as, you know, buying a car we know takes a very long time. Um, that there's many things involved. EV adoption is a process. Um, and awareness is probably the very start of that pro process. We have things to consider like financial factors, charging infrastructure across the UK, being able to support mass EV adoption and uptake, um, and also things like industry jargon and, and breaking that down. I think it's easy to, to think about we grew up in the age of the combustion engine. And so that terminology is very familiar to us when it comes to EV. There's that knowledge gap. And so that needs to be broken down uh, as well. And, and finally, con clearly consumer attitudes. There's a, there's a shift that needs, to, that needs to happen there. But you know, the first part of the process, arguably the most important, is awareness and knowledge. And, and that's kind of including how does technology work? You know, what's the functionality of it? How and where to charge? You know, what models are available? Where to find them? All these practical uh, pieces of information that uh, we need to kind of, I, I guess, kind of use social media as digital platform as a tool to break down that barrier. And from a TikTok perspective, you know, we are an entertainment rather than a, a social platform. Uh, small detail, I know, but for those that don't know how, how TikTok works, it's, it's based on an algorithm and it understands your behavior as a user and what a content you enjoy watching. So it's rather than, than the friends that you're connected with. So I've come, kind of come at it from, from that approach. 
from the idea of creating content that's engaging and really talks to the community. And, and over the last you know, two or so, so years, uh, whilst we've been live and active and, and growing, we've seen a real development of subcultures and communities evolve and grow on the platform around sustainability, around EV, uh, around cars in general as well. And I think there's, there's a few things to consider. The role that we can play is, is one of, of education um, and, and information, but providing it in a way that really engages with the audience. I often talk to my clients about creating content that is native to the platform. Yeah, and by that, I mean content that's actually users are able to get involved with, that's, whether that's to share their thoughts, to kind of comment, to get involved in hashtag challenges, which is one of the, the campaigns that we run uh, at TikTok. There needs to be the ability that users can get involved. On, on the platform, we have uh, what I would say is probably slightly younger than your average car buyer. But what that means is that it's a younger generation that are actually leaned into sustainability, that are leaned into electric vehicles, and they want to make a difference. So 70% of our UK audience are actually more likely to own and buy an EV, which is a great place to start. And, and the barriers that we face are maybe less around kind of that initial perception and awareness, but more around the practicality means of purchasing an electric car. So things around price, myth busting around that, but also around the ability to charge cars um, and, and the supportive infrastructure that comes with EV. And so, What's, what kind of digital and social platforms can provide is a tool, opportunity, a platform to engage with the community. They're leaned in. TikTok users, they like to interact and they enjoy watching ads uh, on the platform. It's kind of part of the experience when you come onto TikTok. So the question is really, can, can brands utilize that platform and create content that's not only entertaining, but has an inf informative um, an educational nature to it. So in recent months, we've seen the likes of Fiat, Porsche and Skoda all run electric focus campaigns with huge success uh, and upcoming campaigns, which I can't talk too much about, but focus purely on the ability to charge cars and actually to bust the myth around the length of which you can go to when charging a car or on, on one full charge, because we know that's one of the kind of uh, drawbacks to owning uh, an EV. The other thing I think to, to consider when it comes to digital and social platforms is the influence that younger generations have on older generations. And that's probably particular pertinent for, for TikTok. But it is a case of going, if you, if you inform and educate the younger adults, the younger generation, someone in their 20s has just purchased their first electric car, they become the mouthpiece for the electric, for the EV movement. Um, and they act on behalf of the industry and communicating with their parents, maybe their grandparents or their uncles and aunts who maybe aren't as familiar with their technology uh, as they are. So it's using those younger adults, those young, that younger generation uh, for our benefit. And I think the other, the other question we often get asked, and it's probably a good one to answer here is, well, what does that type of content look like? What do users actually want to see when they come onto the platform when it comes to automotive advertising and automotive campaigns? There are kind of three key content areas that we say to focus on. The first are tips and tricks. So car hacks are a hugely popular content piece uh, on, uh, on the platform. So can brands create content all around that? Did you know your electric vehicle could do this? Or did you know your electric vehicle could do that? The second is live videos and test drives. It's an amazing way to talk to the users in a very down to earth and real way. So what about reviewing an electric vehicle? What about taking the EV on the road, taking it from charging point to charging point, really testing and stress testing out the vehicle um, in a live demo format? And finally, maybe slightly strangely, is accessory. So anything to accessorize a car. And to be honest, we've seen the design of EV vehicles generally are um, looking better and better. And I think a content around how you can accessorize your car to help with performance, or in this case, to help with maybe the range that the, your car goes is another interesting place to play. What it comes down to is content that engages and entertains, but underneath it all is a way that we inform and educate a generation that perhaps 
uh, could do with some awareness when it comes to EV. But I would say to kind of finish is that this is a, a hugely exciting time for the industry, probably the most exciting time um, that we've been a part of. And yes, the last year, year and a half has sped up that change. But what's been amazing to see is the fact that the audience, the consumers and community are wanting to come along that journey too. And there's been an amazing willingness to get on board uh, and learn more or want to learn more uh, about the EV movement. Thank you very much for listening to me today. Jack, it's been fascinating to listen to you and so many great points you've made there. Now, as we know, we're going to break at half past to head over to the White House of all places. Um, so I'm going to squeeze in a couple of quick questions and we might need to get some um, some, some quick answers on these, I'm afraid. Oh. But um, firstly, quick questions coming from the crowd. Um, how can B2B companies start using TikTok in an authentic manner that doesn't feel forced or actually inauthentic? Yeah, it's a really good question. So I'm going to go slightly off off vertical or off, off industry, and I'm going to go to um, B2B in in a software sales. So Sage, uh, which I'm sure you're familiar with, they ran an amazing B2B campaign, uh, and it was all around bossing it. And I think the idea there was to find something which is important to you as a business, but then is easy for consumers to interpret themselves. Um, and Sage is all around bossing it. So so bossing your own personal admin, but then they open it up for interpretation, and they asked the TikTok community how do you boss your life? Uh, and people got involved and, and they wanted to kind of share their stories of bossing it. And so that's my recommendation. Find something what your B2B uh, company actually represents and what you can talk about, but then also find what the consumer angle is of that. How can the TikTok community or the community in general get involved uh, and engage with that campaign? Brilliant, thank you. Um, here's, here's another great question, he's brilliant. Supercar Blondie is one of the most followed automotive influencers on TikTok. What's your thoughts on how important influencers and creators are in starting to drive awareness and education for EV? Yeah, so so creators within TikTok, we see them as, a, as the creative director. It's kind of a new breed of creative director. They have amazing ways uh, to create content. They really understand how the platform works. Uh, quite simply, they're hugely important because they talk in a way that the, that the uh, audience like to listen to and they understand. And so uh, one of our recommendations when I talk to brands is work with creators. They know the platform better than anyone um, and getting them on board. And we often work with creators uh, because what we ask them is say, well, we, we, we have an EV message. We want you to deliver it in your way. And so we have creators who are focused on fashion or luxury or photography, nothing really actually to do with automotive, but then they, they create a message which is all around EV in their own way, which actually is engaging with the audience more so than if it comes straight from an automotive creator. So there are many ways to go about it, but I mean, creators are absolutely the kind of main tool um, and most useful tool when spreading the EV message. Like you said, it's, it's that shortcut to a brand not being inauthentic, isn't it? Because they're exactly using that. your platform for the way people consume it. Fantastic. Um, so you touched on this earlier. You've got a huge following of young people. Um, do you see a role and responsibility for TikTok in pushing EVs and other climate change solutions, even if these young people can't necessarily afford the technology at the moment or even have licenses to drive? Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, I think you know, as, as TikTok, yes, we we kind of um, we're slightly younger. I think now we're we're seeing a much more kind of older shift to to, to TikTok as a platform, just because of um, the content we create is really for everyone. Um, uh, and so, yeah, we're sixty five percent of our audience actually across Europe are over twenty five, but still in that kind of twenty five to thirty four to forty four category. What we I consider, let's say, young adults. Uh, I think we consider them, you know, the buyers of tomorrow, if not today. Uh, and so, you know, building brand relevancy, saliency uh, is, is extremely important. And whilst it may not be on the wish list for tomorrow, we hopefully, if not tomorrow, it will be next year or the year after. Uh, they are the most important generation to be talking to because they are the ones who are going to be you know, with the spending power in the not too distant future. Absolutely. Brilliant. Well, um, thank you so much, Jack, for uh, giving us your thoughts welcome, this you. afternoon. Um, and like I said, we'll, we'll come back to you on the panel um, in a short while. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, um, this is the moment we're going to break um, this really interesting discussion. So we can watch a new piece of video um, from President Biden's National Climate Advisor, Gina McCarthy. Um, now, I understand Gina's going to speak about World EV Day and the US's commitment to electric vehicles. So we're going to break now, watch this video for a minute, and then we're going to come straight back to the panel. 
So first of all, uh, I hope everybody is enjoying World EV Day. Let's celebrate, you know, the fact that we have these terrific vehicles. And the most exciting part of this, and maybe even electrifying part of this, moving another pond forward, is that these vehicles are, are like so high performing. They make so much sense and they can do so much good for our air quality as well as our climate challenge. So this is hugely exciting, Ben, to, to celebrate and to have you to celebrate with. Thanks. So how fantastic to have the support of the, uh, the US um, presidency behind uh, behind today's EV day. Um, now that full address, I know I know that's just a very short excerpt, but the full address um, is gonna be available on EV World Day's, um, also World EV Day's YouTube channel. Uh, so once you've finished with us this afternoon, please do head over there and take a look. Now over to our penultimate speaker, Michelle Davis. Michelle is the digital communications um, lead at LinkedIn. Um, she works with car brands to bring their EV stories to LinkedIn members through technology, creativity and data. Michelle is a digital communication specialist and in 16 years has seen a number of seismic shifts in technology and user behaviour. Her passion is the ever-changing nature of automotive and how technology is enabling both mobility and retail to evolve into a more consumer-centric and sustainable offering. Michelle, it's great to see you again. It's hot off the hills of hosting day two of last week's EV Summit. Um, today, EV, uh, today, Michelle, you're going to be taking the questions, not posing them. Um, so sit back and relax. <laughs> but um, please, um, if you've got questions, Michelle, please put them in the Q&A tab so we can pose them to her after she's given us her thoughts on um, how social media can evolve um, people's perceptions of EV. Thanks so much, Anita. And I'm not quite sure how I can follow that video that we've just seen there from Gina McCarthy. Uh, fantastic address being made, and I look forward to seeing the full piece of video a little bit later on. So thanks very much to the team at Green TV behind World EV Day for inviting me along today. It's excellent to see World EV Day gain more and more momentum each year. I got to know the team by connecting on LinkedIn after seeing on the platform the great initiatives and conversations that were being driven by World EV Day and the EV Summit. EV is a big passion point of mine, as is social media. At LinkedIn, we have a, had a big focus on EV for a number of years now, driven by a growing amount of EV content on the platform and huge increases in engagement with EV related topics by our members. In our 2020 study into EV, the journey to electrification, we saw that consideration amongst our members to owning an EV had tripled over the previous three years. This represents a tipping point with audiences whereby they're actively seeking out and sharing content around EV amongst their peers. This poses a great opportunity for car brands who are able to create a dialogue with potential customers who are already some way down their journey of understanding and considering an EV. On the more broader topic of sustainability, which is also huge on LinkedIn, we're seeing similar levels of growth. And in fact, World EV Day ranks as one of the top organizations followed by our more sustainably minded members. This is all great progress, but we need to move faster. To answer the question, how can social be used as a tool for accelerating adoption and awareness of EVs? I think it's down to a combination of things. Launching an EV product isn't enough to help drive the movement. We need to step up to the expectations of consumers. From marketing campaigns, right through to the executive presence of leadership teams on our platform. Social media is a great place for sharing content and brand stories that bring the world of EV to life. To finish, I would say we come to LinkedIn to develop ourselves and our professional network that can be leveraged by showcasing the real people that sit behind the product, the logo, the technology. I believe that sharing these real stories about real people will help to grow the EV community and power greater uptake of electric vehicles over time. Thank you, Michelle. Um, really interesting thoughts there. And as a huge advocate myself of um, 
following lots of people on LinkedIn and seeing so many stories. I think like you, I was very inspired with the work Aid does um, and the work of EV World particularly. And then like you said, the fact that brands have got a lot to talk about. So um, it is a great platform for promoting what is going on at the moment. Um, I'm gonna have a look at the kind of questions that are coming in for you. Um, there's quite a lot, so we'll start going through them. Uh, the first question says, we often find ourselves in echo chambers on social media platforms. Um, that might be a bit of perception there, we might need to correct that one. Only seeing news and content that confirms our pre-existing views. One of the aims of World EV Day is to bring together partners and break through these echo chambers. What else is LinkedIn doing to break down these echo chambers and broaden people's horizons, especially when it's in relation to EV, climate change and a move away from fossil fuels? Well, a bit of a tough one, that one. <laughs> yeah, it's a long one. Um, I would say by its nature, LinkedIn is more of a professional social environment. So we tend to see the behavior of our members is a little bit more mindful in that they're trying to either share content that they think that their peers will find interesting or uh, insightful. And they're all trying to come to the platform to develop themselves as well. So we often find that the conversations we see on LinkedIn, many of our members are trying to add new points of view into the conversation. So for that reason, it tends to be less like an echo chamber. And um, we now have a, a great, amount of scale when it comes to audiences. We've just surpassed 774 million members worldwide. So within those audiences, we've got quite a wide range of, of demographics. You know, we've got senior leaders in business, we've got small and medium businesses, we've got employers, we've even got students. So all of those different demographic groups, uh, different groups of seniority, understanding, will all be bringing their different viewpoints to the platform. So I would say there's many different ways um, around that. Plus also the amount of different formats that we have available to enable our members to communicate with one another. They have access to the likes of long form articles in which they can, you know, they can take uh, the stage and, and actually write a long form piece, which they can get a complex viewpoint across with. We have polls as well. That's a great way of, you know, putting a short and snappy um, uh, question out there to get other viewpoints coming back to you. So I'd say, I'd say that's kind of, some of the ways that we try and avoid that echo chamber scenario. Yeah, and I, I think also to add to that, I think sometimes the echo chamber conversation can become um, a little bit too much of a perception because if you think of old, people would buy like one regular newspaper or they would tend to watch a limited amount of channels. I think what's been proven is actually social media in its existence has actually opened people up to many, many more ideas than they would ever have been exposed to previously. And yes, it's quite simple for some people just like stay within their norms of what they want to hear. But for most people, horizons have actually been expanded as a result of the presence of social media and taken us into a new world of extra thoughts. So I think, you know, like I said, there's, there's a long way to go in terms of how we can shift people's perceptions moving on. Um, I've got another question here. LinkedIn currently has a great change makers campaign that brings to life creative professionals. How do you plan to use more campaigns like this to drive change for EVs? So we've got a big drive at the moment, appreciating the fact that actually, in order to have the best kind of content on LinkedIn, not just in relation to EV sustainability, but for any topic, it really is down to the content creators uh, in order to try and kind of help that richness come through. So we do actually promote significantly now more so than ever, this ability to actually become a content creator. And if you actually go on your, on your profile, you can actually select that now as an option. So this is really opening up the doors to kind of influencers, influencers shall I say on LinkedIn, we, we don't really kind of tend to refer to them as that. We would perhaps explain more to do with thought leadership, those kind of topics and really allowing people who have a voice, who have a credible point of view about topics like EV and sustainability, e-mobility, to actually share those points of view and create exciting types of content on the platform to get those messages across. Thank you. Uh, this, this is a really interesting one. Um, and I'm, obviously, we're all still working from our homes. We're not back in offices yet. Um, have you noticed an increase in more personal content since the pandemic? are we blurring the lines between work and home life? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, yeah, people ask, ask me this a lot. And of course, uh, during the pandemic, we saw a huge surge in terms of usage on the platform. We saw a huge rise in both connections being made, 
conversations that were happening, content that was being generated, because of course we couldn't meet up in person, we were all thrown into this virtual world. So absolutely that was something that we saw um, rising hugely on the platform. In terms of kind of the more personal side of things, I think we are seeing some of that now starting to creep in and I think uh, people are becoming a little bit less afraid of using the platform. It can be a little bit daunting um, uh, for some people to use LinkedIn because, you know, they know that their peers are on there, my boss is on there, uh, people are going to see what I'm saying and kind of make a, a viewpoint about me professionally. So I think that some of our members, which I think is great to see, are starting now to kind of open up and be a little bit more personal with some of the viewpoints that, that they tend to share. On LinkedIn, like, like many of the other platforms here today, you know, um, diversity and inclusion is a huge topic for us. And I think that topic does allow some more of those kind of personal stories to come filtering through. So, which is, which is great to see. And I think, you know, opening up those areas of dialogue between people who may be connections professionally, but edging more into that personal world is, is, reflected, is reflective of what we've seen in the whole working from home environment where we've had, or we've all been on Zoom calls where kids have been interrupting in the background or the dog's been barking. You know, I think it's just natural that we're gonna to start to see that coming through. Sure, thank you. Well, Michelle, I hope it's been pleasurable to sit in the uh, hot seat today and not be on the other side of the fence. Don't go too far, we're gonna come back to you for the panel. But thank you for your, your points of view today. So now, finally, time for our last speaker, and that's Laura McNally. Uh, Laura's Head of Content over at uh, Autotrader, um, and she's built the brand's first ever content and social media team. She launched them on Giphy and TikTok, and she reinvigorated their strategy, which has increased EV focus across YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Prior to this, uh, Laura was Red Bull's global social media um, manager, and she ran their accounts from the headquarters over in Salzburg, Austria. So welcome, Laura. Um, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Anita. Um, so coming from a brand perspective, I thought it would be helpful to run through some of the things that we're doing on social at Autotrader at the moment to help accelerate the adoption of EVs. Um, so the first thing to note is that our business is dependent on the advertising of all fuel types when it comes to cars. So petrol, diesel, hybrid, electric, and all the variants in between. And at the moment we have around 7,000 electric vehicles on site, 29,000 if you include hybrids, which is obviously a huge volume, but relative to our total, that's still only around 2% for electric and 7% if including hybrids. So one of the challenges for us is that we still have a duty to cater for all consumers in the content that we publish on our social channels, alongside demonstrating our passion and dedication for electric, which can be a tricky balance to strike. On an average month at the moment, around 20 to 25% of our content is electric, and that's increasing all the time, partly through our own prioritization, and also through the fact that we are largely driven by new car launches, and more and more of these are just naturally electric now. That hopefully helps to demonstrate how electric focused we are, because obviously the amount of electric content we're publishing isn't proportionate to stock levels, it's much, much higher. In support of World EV Day, we're only posting electric content on our channels this week, and we'll also be doing a No Ice Fember to coincide with COP26, where we commit to only posting electric content across all of our channels that month. And one of the things that we've noticed with this is that we'll need to communicate that as it could happen naturally in the coming months that if we didn't state that's what we were doing, then given how new car focused we are and how much of that is driven by OEM launch calendars, then it could just naturally be a month full of electric content. So we'll be very focused and communicating that, that we're dedicating that month to electric. Um, in terms of our motives for electric, one is that we're a very values driven organization. So we're conscious of the part that our industry and our company has played in contributing to global warming. And we want to do what we can to take responsibility for that and to make things better. Another is acknowledging that we need to use our voice on our platforms for good and not shy away from the tough stuff, which I think is something that we're all united in from on the platforms that we're representing today. We're also very lucky in that Rory Reid, who hosts and presents all of our content, is genuinely an evangelist and he really believes in the experience that electric cars deliver. So we're really blessed with that because it means we are authentic in the content that we're creating. And then some current and recent initiatives. So we've recently launched a monthly electric car giveaway. It's, it's a Lexus UX 300E, so shameless plug there, but please do enter. Um, and we have a Jaguar I-Pace, a Mustang Mach-E and a Tesla all in the pipeline as well. But the purpose of that is to raise awareness of Autotrader as an electric car destination. So people come to play, but then hopefully they might stay. This creates a wealth of social content opportunities too. So we have reminder posts, winner videos, 
and it allows people to follow the journey. And to Jack's point earlier about ensuring the content is native to the platform, we do ensure each post is bespoke for the platform. Our TikTok EV giveaway posts, for example, are very different to our Facebook posts for the same campaign. We've also got a myth busting series, which has launched this week. And Rory breaks down six of the most common EV myths going from range, that they're boring, that they're too expensive, things like that. And we'll use these myths going forward to help shape our electric content, really kind of honing the thinking as to which myth is the next piece of content helping to conquer. We also have a used Nissan Leaf coming series coming up. So we have bought the cheapest Nissan Leaf on Autotrader and then Rory's gonna run it as a long-termer and talk about the, the experience in detail. And that's really, I guess, to kind of show that it's not just brand new electric cars that are an option for people, that they can be affordable in the used car space now as well. And they can be a viable option for consumers beyond those that think that they're in the, in the right demographic. Um, we also have a lot of electric influencer activity coming up. So uh, recently we had Josh Peters who famously stitched up Katie Hopkins. Um, he's just done a road trip in a Corsa E with his girlfriend for us. And we have the Cabs family and Emma Walsh who have worked on that brief as well. And the reason that we're very focused on that is because we recognize the impact the influencers and peers have over journalists' views and opinions when it comes to experiencing new technologies such as electric vehicles. And just to I kind of echo a lot of what's been said already, but diversity kind of underpins that brief as well. So we've asked to make sure that there's diversity and representation at the heart of, of the people that we're using in that campaign. Our organic social content isn't aimed at those in market, it's aimed at those out of market and is informative and interesting to people who are out of market. And maybe it will hit those in market as well, but on the whole, our approach is long-term relationship building over time, recognizing that people will be at very different points on their electric vehicle journey and catering for, catering for as many of them as possible and as, as effectively as possible. And that's deliberate and necessary if we're going to make an impact. We foster debate on our social channels as well. So one of the ways in which we kind of um, accommodate both people that are you know, petrol head in nature versus electric focused is, is creating posts that might say something like electric cars are and allow people to fill in the blank. And these types of posts are really good for us, A, for getting real-time feedback and sentiment from our audiences, but also just allowing you know, to foster the debate and, and conversation on our channels. And they show that we're not necessarily, you know, choosing, you know, a direction, although we do a lot of electric activity, we're just allowing people to still have a voice, regardless of whether they're kind of more ice or, or more electric in nature. Um, I would say we don't always get it right. So one example is that we did an emoji reaction vote where we said use a heart reaction if you're about petrol and use a lightning bolt if you're about electric. And that got shared in some electric forums with people saying that we were anti electric. So kind of a, never underestimate the, the politics of emojis, but also I think that taught us that we need to assume that each piece of social content could be seen in isolation. The way that it travels means that many people will have no idea how many electric campaigns we're running. So it's important to make our stance clear in every communication, either through post copy or through signposting to other relevant content. And then the final thing that we're focused on at the moment is production techniques to help minimize our carbon footprint. So whether that might be planting a tree for every ice review, that's something that we're discussing doing at the moment, or lots of companies are offering sustainable production training, but we think it's really important to be as sustainable behind the camera as we are in front of it. So thank you for inviting us to take part and we are so excited about the future of electric. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, great to hear those amazing initiatives and such a long list of things that you're working on. Uh, truly take my hat off to you and your team. Um, so if we go to the questions that have come in for you, um, this is interesting. And again, I think you, you put, raised it slightly with your point about the Nissan Leaf, but uh, the secondhand market is going to be vital for full adoption and uptake. How much importance is auto trace placing on EVs and used? Um, so I think the Nissan Leaf series that I mentioned will be our first kind of foray into content of that kind, but it's come through a recognition of how important it is um, and that that's going to be the entry point for a lot of people. You know, there, there's naturally, I think, more skepticism because people have, that's a whole nother set of myths to bust, you know, that with an older electric vehicle, they have more, you know, battery problems than a new one, for example. But I would say that we've got much more content planned and this is the first entry point into, into much greater um, depth. That's great to hear. Um, Auto Trader also has a huge social footprint. How have you seen the audience engage with the monthly EV giveaway? Was it as popular as you anticipated? 
Um, that's a good question. I think we'd never done anything like this before, so we really didn't know where to set our, our expectations, but um, it's done really brilliantly for us. So, um, and it's varied from month to month as we'd expect. So one of the things that we've been very mindful of is making sure that we're representing the range of electric cars available. So every month is a different car. So we launched on a, a Tesla and then we went to a Renault Twizy, for example. And so there were naturally, and we expected that there'd be comments, you know, like, oh, you know, why, why would I want to win a, win a Twizy when I could have won a Tesla? Um, but that, that actually did brilliantly for us on TikTok. The Twizy got a lot of attention on, on TikTok. So, um, I think it's done, you know, it's, it's superseded our, our expectations and we might run it longer than a year now. We plan to do it for a year, but um, I think we're close to a million entries now um, over a few months. So it's really been brilliant for us. That's great engagement. Um, now I've heard your colleagues talk a lot about digital retailing. Um, this question's coming, during the pandemic, many OEMs use social media to promote ways to buy a car online. Do you think this will continue and will we be able to click through from social to actually buy a car without seeing it in person? Yeah, I definitely do. Um, it's weird. I was talking about this recently and how like, you know, digital retailing, things become, they're prefixed with something until they become the norm. So eventually digital retailing will just be our retailing. And okay. I think social will play a really big part in that. But yeah, I absolutely think that's really not too far away um, from happening. Fantastic. And uh, does Auto Trader see itself giving EVs a higher platform than ICE vehicles going forward? I mean, I think you've talked a lot about you're going to do a takeover the next month, but once November's over, what, what will happen then? Um, like I said before, it is a tricky balance to, to, to strike because I think there's some people that will switch to an electric car tomorrow and there's other people that will have maybe four, five, six cars between now and being forced to switch to electric. And it's really important that we're able to accommodate consumers that, you know, wherever they are on that, that journey. Um, so I think the importance of electric isn't going anywhere for us. It's, it's naturally going to be very high, but I think we, we can't shy away from the fact that we still have a duty to, you know, to review and represent ICE vehicles as well. Um, so I think it will probably be a situation where over time, the proportion just increases and increases at the rate at which we get closer to 2030. Yeah. And I guess especially now as the we see an awful lot of the manufacturers prioritizing EVs out of the factory given the chip shortages we've got on our hands. So exactly. uh, like you said, the, the proportional split is going to shift even faster than we would have anticipated. It's going it's to be like COVID part two. If COVID accelerated digital retailing, chip shortage is going to accelerate EV supply and then obviously the demand will follow I'm sure I'm sure yep. um Laura fascinating uh to hear from you don't go anywhere I think we're going to bring everybody back onto the the floor the virtual floor um so we can have a, a final panel discussion so I'll just let our producers bring everybody back so I guess um what we're going to do is give the floor to Dean as our panel partner have we got we got Dean back with us? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, hi, Dean. Fantastic. Um, I think we're going to give you the floor to ask the first question. If you've got one, having heard all the other fascinating uh, discussions this afternoon, is there anything you'd like to now pose to any of your fellow panellists? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So my first question would be to Laura from Auto Trader, And just wanting to know, um, the more content that has been put out around EVs, have you seen more of an uptake in the entrance to these competitions? Yeah, we have actually. Um, and we're starting to see a lot of repeat entrants now as well. Um, but I, I think social has been very influential in that. But we've also done quite a lot around kind of a, a developed CRM program. So we're going out to people once they've entered to say, you know, that, that you know, they've been entered into the prize draw and then that we do a, like a kind of mid-month communication to them as well. And that's really helping, I think, to drive a lot of um, what we call F FPA, so full page ad views for whichever cars featured that month. They're then going through and looking at the stock um, which has a benefit because that's, you know, obviously very positive for the OEMs and that, you know, whets the appetite for other OEMs to be involved as well. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I, I would say it's definitely driving people, you know, a lot more people into electric stock than, than previously. And I think, well, no, no, you've got a few people asking you questions. I think Michelle, you wanted to post one to Laura while she's still on. Yeah, if that's okay. Um, Laura, sorry to put you under the spotlight again. <laughs> yes. Um, so we tend to see in, in most of the research that it's Gen Z that are most engaged with EV and, and, and they're the ones that are kind of driving the movement. But it's, you know, with everything, it's the older generations like the baby boomers that are actually the purchasers. How do you think we kind of can bridge that gap? 
Um, that's interesting, actually. I was thinking about this last night, and and there's been some recent campaigns, um, like Gucci did, uh, Gucci Garden did a partnership with um, Roblox, um, the kind of online gaming platform, where they sold a bag virtually for more than what it would cost in real life. So it went for like four thousand pounds virtually, um, and that I think is quite an interesting space for for younger generations. And you know, if if a younger, you know, someone young was able to to build or be part of the development and creation process of their own car in a virtual space that they could then aspire to get in real life. I think that's really interesting. I know that Hyundai have done some kind of work in, in that sphere, but they've kind of used it as an opportunity to showcase products that they already have. Um, whereas I think, you know, they, they talk about kind of experiences being the way that you create loyalty with, with consumers and younger consumers more, even more so. So I think having them be part of that process could be a really powerful way to, you know, to ensure that adoption is is on their mind as soon as possible. Um, yeah, I think. And then I think the, obviously that's that's a platform conscious that that's a platform that we're not all representing today. But I think off the back of that, that would breed a lot of content opportunities. You know, it would provide a lot of talkability on on the platforms that we're all more familiar with. Fantastic. Thank you, Laura. Did you did you Laura have a question for Jack? Um, I do, yes. Uh, sorry, let me just quickly find it. So, uh, well, it's kind of a question for everyone, but I guess it makes sense to, to talk about it from a TikTok perspective as well. And it's just really, it was which of the platforms is going to be the most influential in speeding up the rate of EV adoption and why? Um, <laughs> we'll talk so, from all our own bias from our agenda. <laughs> I, I, well, I, why don't I kick it off? And I guess I can, I can kind of take, and I, I guess I touched on it on um, in, in my presentation that um, is that the power of influence that I think sort of the younger adults and generation can have. I mean, ultimately, it's a combined effort, um, and it's you're not just going to talk to one generation, and that, and that does the job. We need we need to be talking to to all demographics, to be honest, and, and we need to be doing it in in all different parts on all different platforms, and it's kind of a connective thing that we need to kind of be working, you know, alongside one another. Um, and, and kind of playing to our strengths as, as individual platforms and doing it in a way that really speaks to our individual audiences. I mean, as I said, I think there are different barriers when it comes to each demographics, as we know. So with the, the slightly younger uh, adults, it's maybe less of a concern of knowledge and that, you know, they, they are, are aware. Whilst they haven't been brought up uh, with EV, it's definitely been part of the conversation for, for more recent years than it is for the older uh, generation. You know, as I said, it's kind of more practical terms. What's what's the financial costs with EVs? That you know, kind of feels like a bit of a blocker for me. So I'm, I don't really want to do that now. You know, what am I going to be able to do? Can I go? Will I get lost in the middle of the country when I'm traveling? Um, how many many miles without charge? Um, you know, I want to pop down. Can I do that on on one charge? I don't want to be waiting. How long am I going to be charging for? And I guess in that sense, as I said, it, we can use social or digital platforms as as really a place for information, because it's a way of 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 informing people and educating people in a way which we haven't been able to educate or inform before um, and, and done in a way which, which is quite simple and very easy to understand, but at a level and on a level which they can appreciate and, and engage with. So I guess that's from a TikTok perspective. I'm not sure Anita or Michelle, if you had kind of any other thoughts from your side. I'll, I'll, I'll let you give some. Yeah, Michelle. Yeah, um, and, and you know, we all know that us as individuals we all use all of our platforms at some point during the day and you know we all use them for, for very different reasons certainly from a linkedin standpoint uh that the the member mindset is, is quite unique we tend to find that our members lean into um things like technology and innovation they, they have done for, for many many years and for that reason they tend to be early adopters Hence why EV has been a, a big topic of conversation on LinkedIn for a number of years. And um, like I said in, in my piece early, that earlier, that has grown exponentially in the past three or four years. I think over 400% we've seen traction in um, the EV hashtags be, being used on LinkedIn. So, you know, for us, the conversation is, is definitely there. How does that then translate into actually uptake of EVs and, and sale of EVs? I think really that's now down to the, the OEMs and the car brands to actually capitalize upon those, conversa those conversations that are taking place. We did some work uh, last year to create a, a, a bespoke custom audience segment of um, our members that have an affinity towards EV. So anybody that's engaging in the past three months with any content relating to EV, video, um, uh, 
traction uh, EV hashtags will all be placed into that segment. So if, a, if an automotive brand has an EV campaign, they can utilize that segment instantly. And they already know that those members within that segment have a reasonably good understanding or engagement with the topic already. Brilliant. Should we, should we head to Dean? What's, what's, the, what's Green TV's view on who's going to be first and what's your role in convincing people? I was I just unmute myself. Um, I think it's quite interesting from kind of an agency standpoint, um, just because it's more about what kind of clients are used to already. Um, so a new kind of platform like TikTok is going to take a little bit more convincing to certain companies that we work with than, than LinkedIn or things that they are used to. So I think for us, it's more about just working with those platforms and getting people as, you know, on board with them as possible. Fantastic. Laura, Laura you posed the question. Do you, on, do you want to give your thoughts on uh, your role? Uh, auto trader, I would be. <laughs> no, no, I think, um, I think, no, no, I think it's a good point that, that or that I was being playful, I guess, in asking the question, because I think they all, it's the harmony of them coming together. You know, people, as Michelle said, using them at different points in the day for different things. Um, and I think it, you know, it needs us all to come together to, to have the biggest impact. So. I love it. And I think it's such a well posed question because this is the first time that I'm aware of in the UK specifically that all of us have actually come together um, and sat alongside one another and talked about collectively how social can can support a huge cause like this in, in the world of automotive. And I guess if I'm just to kind of like some summarize and, and add our point of view to that brilliant question. I mean, I, our superpower is scale and size. Um, you know, Facebook, largest reach platform um, now, um, across across the world, not just in the UK, and you know, Facebook. We've got um, obviously a huge amount of users, forty three million across our Facebook family of apps in the UK. So that's including Instagram, which has a slightly different um, sense of where people come to it. We've got WhatsApp and messaging, which are becoming like really strong direct to I mean business to consumer, consumer to business channels, which they have emerged as in in recent years, especially through the pandemic. Um, and then, you know, we're going to go into the world of Oculus and virtual reality and, you know, we've made big announcements about the future of the metaverse. So, you know, whilst we're not going to say the future of in-person retailing is here to stop, it's not. But on, on top of that, you know, the ability to like virtually explore a vehicle without leaving your front room um, is absolutely here, ready and, and now um, as, as brands start to emulate it. And, and I think the other thing is like we've all managed to go an entire <laughs> hour or so now without mentioning the word algorithm and you know we've talked a lot about diversity avoiding discrimination getting these messages out to as wide a bunch of people as possible and you know when algorithms are becoming smarter than the um traditional you know planning teams who would have looked at who used to buy cars we've got to now predict into the future who's going to buy cars and i think we've all been taken aback by the fact that younger audiences are now really interested in electric which perhaps we wouldn't have thought was the case we would have thought it'd be the older audiences more affluent audiences but actually it's the younger audiences driving this change so we're going to need to rely on machine learning even more to predict and find and reach and target the people that are going to buy the cars in the future and we're already seeing some huge successes in trust the algorithm trust the machine learning to go find your audiences and that's giving us that ability to like convince people that would have been discriminated against in the past and not targeted um i, th I think one of the things our industry is really guilty of doing is targeting 35 year olds and above because we seem to think people don't buy a car until they're 35 um and we all know that and when we change that brief to the machine that says just find people that engage in the content just find people that want to configure a vehicle or request a test drive we see an awful lot more people engaging, responding and becoming leads than if we restrict the targeting down. So um, I think like we said, everyone's got superpowers, every every platform reaches slightly different skew of people. And collectively, I think we can all start to drive that change really quickly now for EV. Who's next? Who would like to ask a question to one another? I've got a question, Go. if that's okay. Yeah, hi. <laughs> Um, and uh, I guess I'll I'll put this one I'll put this one to, to the room and then whoever wants to answer it can jump in. Um, but of course now we're seeing that OEMs car brands are releasing EV products 
launching them it feels like on a weekly basis and now that the whole marketplace is coming is becoming highly competitive so how do the panel think that brands can make their ev products stand out from the rest of the competition i can i guess i can take that so uh, it, it, it an interesting one um i went to to yeah, goodwood the other week um uh, was that probably about a month ago or so now and I, I saw some of some of the models on on display and there were some really interesting ones i saw the Sitchin Ami, which i don't know has been yet confirmed for the uk it's now got a Euro, european launch um but there was there's talk about it coming out in, in the uk i'm not sure if that's been confirmed but a very distinctive model and i'm sure you're aware of it um that would just shake things up because of even how it's going to be priced and the model it's supposedly going to be a subscription uh model which is amazing because you're then again flipping the script with how people purchase cars you know it's all about we're used to now getting things on subscription um and we've seen obviously companies uh, i don't need to list them out but we all know who have gone from strength to strength and and, and don't dominate globally now based on a subscription model. So um, that was I thought was really interesting and, and it's a very unique car. Um, I'm 6'3", so I don't know if I'd actually fit in it, um, but it was a challenge I was willing to accept. Um, and actually just seeing it out there was, was, was very strange. But I think, I mean, to your question, how do they how do they stand out? Um, I mean, it, it comes down to how they've always tried to stand out, like what makes the brand distinctive versus their other automotive competitors, like what makes them unique? And, and I, there's almost a reset that they can go about and actually say the electric age, they can kind of redefine what the brand stands for. Um, you know, we have kind of perceptions of, of what Audi or, or BMW or Mercedes or Mini um, or Toyota represented. It kind of goes, well, actually, you're kind of at ground zero again when it comes to the electric age. So where do you go? And, and there's very much kind of to be defined there's going to be a lot of crossover no doubt um but i think it's an exciting time because uh they oh, i think they're, they're they're finding their feet i haven't kind of quite yet identified or seen what a really a brand stands for when it comes to ev um so i'm looking forward to it yeah i mean creative is vitally important right so you know what do they stand for when it comes to creating content um and what does it represent when they talk about evs anybody else yeah well, sorry, no, I was just going to say, I think design design in, in and of itself is, is going to be one of the kind of key things. So the Hyundai Ionic 5 has done really well for us on any, any kind of content level. And I think to Jack's point, like traditionally, I guess Hyundai as a brand wouldn't have been the most high performing, but that car has done so much better and it does kind of force you to reconsider the brand. Um, and then sound design, I think, is also going to be a point of differentiation, especially in convincing the petrol heads, you know, so one of the things that they miss the most is the sound and the roar of the engine. So there's lots of work being done in that space. And I think that could that could be a, a real point of differentiation amongst them. And I think actually on the reverse of that, I've not seen anybody yet market their vehicles as a wellness environment, you know, and this overriding comment that's coming through from the research we're seeing that people just love the serenity of driving a car that suddenly doesn't have noise and you know this is going to polarize people completely but a whole new audience of people that are going to enjoy actually just a quieter drive um the clarity of their in-car entertainment systems i was coming back yesterday in the vehicle trying to hold a phone call which was really hard to hear the person because of the you know the, the noise going on so i just think this is a whole new way to position cars potentially for a whole new millennial audience that's now coming into market as well for the first time. Um, and, you know, one of the other things we saw from our research is an awful lot of the people considering an electric car right now are actually driving their very first car. So this is going to be the second car purchase ever. So I think we're reimagining now what car driving is going to be like. And it's so important to remember the petrol heads obviously have a really strong point of view and obviously at the moment a very, very loud voice. But to your point about the more we start to communicate electric in the coming months and dominate the conversation with electric in the coming months, how can we encourage this millennial audience that are going to be a powerful buying house as we move forward and probably part of the early adopter movement as we move forward to start talking about a new way of driving, a calmer way of driving, maybe a less aggressive way of driving and actually one that's maybe a bit more um, you know, inclusive for all demographics or you know um or you know kind of personality types so I, I think that's going to be really interesting and I'm not seeing anyone like explore that space so I think that's a clean canvas to grab if anyone's listening and wants to go and own that space uh, making notes as we speak <laughs> <laughs> I think you got I'm, a new entry coming 
But one thing we <laughs> jump in on on that is um, definitely like what I spoke about is very much that real world content is making sure that, you know, as an agency, we've worked with multiple OEMs like Nissan and people like that on. We have um, uh, a series of videos called Emotional Instructional Social, and it's very much getting real world people to kind of drive these cars and say what is good about them, what's bad about them. And that's something we've had a lot of buy-in from OEMs to make sure that, you know, real world people are seeing that content. So they know exactly what they're getting as soon as they step into that car. I love that. I love that. You know, until we get more people experiencing, I, th I think this is such an important question. I actually get really point. I get really passionate about this is car. What people once, once people have been inside the car, they are completely converted. Mm. And again, mm. the longer someone owns an electric vehicle, the more they fall in love with it. And the more these perform, you know, there is performance. We know that the cars are more agile, more nippy. Um, and that suddenly becomes a benefit that no one expected. It's an aha moment. Um, and then I mentioned the serenity. And yet most people considering, especially when we look at the petrol heads, are like, it's going to be a compromise. You know, they fear changing is going to compromise so much of their driving pleasure. So the only way we're going to overcome that is to get more people to experience it. Now, if we were launching a new food type, we would be in the supermarket trialing every person that walked through the front door with a little sample pot and getting them to try it. And yet we still protect test drives just for people that are about to buy. But we've got a whole car buying audience to completely convert. So test drive trial experience should be absolutely for forefront. And, you know, we've got an awful lot of cars sitting on four at the moment coming out of those factories. Um, so, again, I think the other thing I would urge, and it's not necessarily something social can solve, but social can certainly drive the movement to it, is get more bums on seats you know mm. the car industry has always talked about bums on seats and we seem to be shying away from it at the moment mm. um i just think that's a huge huge opportunity in the coming months yeah I, I completely agree i mean there's an element of fun which you have with electric vehicles which i don't yeah. think is necessarily spoken about like you get inside and it's almost kind of a go-kart type feel mm. uh which you don't get within within a combustion engine and it's a different type of fun but almost mm -hmm. kind of go well actually let's embrace that embrace that entirely um and as you say Anita it's actually getting people within and I, I guess that from a social perspective it's offering that full funnel right and so you, you we, we drive awareness but it's also key to to drive those leads and, and get people actually sitting and, and and feeling what it is like to an EV because when you sit inside mm -hmm. it you won't want to change I live in, in London I use Zipcar a lot because there's no point owning a car in and around London and you use the e-golf and it's amazing you yeah. just have so much fun um, now it's not always about drive, about fun. There's other elements to it, but it also it, it does bring a freshness to to the drive. So yeah, I completely agree. The more that we can get people actually experiencing an EV, the better. But that is a task because, as you say, there will be the petrol heads who are very resistant to it, and so that's consistent, because yeah. consistent and constant uh, targeting um, everywhere that they go. And eventually, you know, it, it chip away. It, it will take a lot longer, no doubt. But um, yeah, I think they will. They're, they're probably the last to convert. Um, but it, that, that's a significant push, and I think getting them to experience it in in a kind of a live test drive environment, if you can, um, why not? I mean, that's the way that we're going to get these guys converting. Completely, and you know, I think we talked a lot today about like the role of OEMs because we kind of assume that they are doing most of the communications on this but you know there's an awful lot of retailers out there with vehicles yeah. that could be doing a lot to get more people to experience the cars um you know, in the past they've been great at taking their vehicles outside of their showrooms and you know rocking up at venues and, and giving people experiences um when they're not in a shopping environment you know for cars um but also you know think about all the customers that are coming in for servicing right now servicing base has never been so occupied because of the backlog um there's a lot of three-year-old MOT cars coming back in again and just that opportunity when you've got someone sitting in the showroom waiting for their car to be MOT'd or serviced they could just go out try the vehicle come back tell 10 friends or maybe even buy it <laughs> you know that'd be the ultimate goal um and I don't see that happening enough either I think I think there's some big missed opportunities here that retailers can take responsibility for as well as the OEMs can take responsibility for. Interesting topic. Anyone else want to chip in on that one before we move on to another question? I'll, I'll just chip in and answer my yeah. own question. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I feel like there's still a bit of a lack of brand storytelling around EV. Um, you know, we all know that many brands have launched EV vehicles into the market, and I think they kind of think that that alone might might do the job. But I think that there needs to be that other layer of communication that really helps position 
that manufacturer uh, in the EV space and um, whether it be talking more about the production techniques or talking more about the technology or the people that sit behind, you know, the, the, the EV initiatives that they're running. Um, I think that, again, is another missed opportunity or, or an opportunity that, that could be exploited a bit more. I know Audi certainly do a lot in that area when they um, launching e-tron and, and various iterations. They've done a lot of this and I think that that approach has worked really well. So, yeah, I think for me, I think I'd like to see a bit more of that. Is that kind of behind the scenes storytelling, do you think, Michelle, kind of lifting the hood a little bit on 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 their processes and and kind of how they go about or their approach to EV? That's the kind of stuff I'd like to see, yeah. you know, particularly on LinkedIn. We always see really great levels of engagement when we see stories about real people. It's almost mm. like people come to the network to try and like network and, and see one another. So any stories featuring real people always work really well. But on the Audi side of things, with, with their kind of new brand positioning and, and statements, it's very much got Evie at the heart of it. And, it, and, that, and that's a very clear strand of, of their communication. And I just think maybe we need to see that a bit more from some of the other brands as well. Let's, let's explore that kind of real people and taking the power of the comms into either drivers or creators. Um, you know, Jack, you, you've touched on TikTok and creators. Um, obviously, Instagram, there's an awful lot of creators on our platform as well. T tell us what some of the best practices that you're seeing, Jack. Yeah, so uh, kind of linking to the lifting the hood, and I'll again, I'll go slightly off track from automotive, but to F1, um, because there are some hugely popular accounts on TikTok, and, and often the, the, the most interesting videos there are the ones which get the highest rates of engagement are ones from the pit, from the pit lane. Um, and they show, you know, there's one video, I think it's um, uh, Mercedes, and it just basically when they, they scrape off the tire after a session, it's like a heating tool. I mean, sounds bland but but very interesting to watch and, it, and i think like unpacking what that means it, it's kind of showing again behind the scenes beneath the hood of, of how our operation works of which you wouldn't otherwise see um and it's allowing users or the community to kind of see elements they wouldn't otherwise be aware of um and so that's kind of a, a very popular uh, subculture let's say um on on the kind of on the platform so anything around that and i think if we were to apply that to ev how, how is it you know how does an ev car get, how is it put together you know when we took you can talk to people along along the kind of on the production line at various points of, of course there are elements which is top secret um but it, that kind of gives a human element to the process which otherwise would just seem quite robotic um mm -hmm. and i completely agree with michelle anything which has got talking heads talking to camera um, people want to engage with and more interested in watching because mm -hmm. there's a there's a human story to that otherwise it's mm -hmm. kind of you know we have a faceless you know faceless corporations we're breaking that down now and I think what social media has allowed us to do is actually give a face to these companies um, which which users and communities and, and and audiences are really appreciating yeah and, and Jack I mean you've obviously come from the advertising industry background um, and and I guess one of the challenges often is for platforms like TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and you know LinkedIn to, to get involved early enough in these briefs. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of brands thinking about bringing an influencer on board or there's already a commercial agreement in place. Um, I think one of the things that we would love to do is just get the ability to actually advise upstream because mm -hmm. of all the insight we've got on what works on the platform. Is, is that a challenge you find in terms of getting upstream with those briefs? Is that yeah, I mean, a little plea today? Yeah. yeah. T TV always plays a big role in automotive. It, it always has, and, and it probably always will. We, we kind of know the job that it does as a, as a, as a channel. Um, I, I think kind of, yes, we always want to be involved up front and, and kind of at the ideation stage or the brief creation. Practically speaking, that's not always possible. There are many kind of, um, there are many things at play, which means that actually the brief kind of comes down to you when it's been thought out and, and, and molded. What I always try and say is like, let's not have a closed off brief, even if you've got to the idea and you've kind of formed out what the concept is. There's always room for execution or tweaks to be made, but also for the concept to be developed and made for platform. I haven't really come across a brief necessarily where you can't see what the TikTok version of that brief is. But yeah, what I'm, we're trying to do is, is a little bit of an education piece across uh, with, with clients across the industry uh, to get to the point of going when a brief is out and when they're writing a brief and putting it together, they can kind of envisage what the TikTok version of that brief might look like, because that's often the challenge. If you can't see what it would look like on a different platform or on the platform, then you're less inclined to actually be interested to see or hear ideas in that space. 
So um, I see it very much as an education piece, bit by bit. What, what I think, you know, it's a case of educating the right people, uh, but making sure we're as supportive as possible. So that actually when we do uh, see the brief, we can kind of offer some insights or some ideas around how you might be able to mold it so it's fit for fit for platform. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I'm going to look at the panel. Has anyone got any other questions they would like to pose to one another that sprung to mind while we've been talking? Oh, I have one. Okay, fifteen. It's for you, Anita. So OEMs have uh, started selling kind of more cars online. Mm -hmm. Is there kind of any thing for Facebook Marketplace and Instagram to kind of get in on the secondhand car market from them? That's that's a great question. Um, there already are solutions, um, Dean. So any stock feed, you know, obviously. APIs now really fuel, if you to use the word, um, the way that car brands can like uh, share their stock feeds with other platforms. And obviously, um, you know, if you've got a car in stock, it's possible for that to be shown in an advert dynamically. You don't even have to like create an advert any longer. Um, the ad can look at people's behaviors and interests and suggest the right car for the right person. Um, we've got retailers really using this um, solution um, at the fore and more slowly OEMs because obviously the stock isn't really their responsibility. Often the stock will already be wholesale to the retailers, uh, but that's not to say that's a space that's not being explored at the moment. So um, yeah, I mean, whilst it's not necessarily selling direct, it's about getting a lot more eyeballs. Again, our superpower is reach. So a lot, a lot more eyeballs on stock than people may not even be thinking about being a market, but we talk a lot about discovery commerce today. And I'm sure we're all guilty of like looking at our phones, going through our feeds and suddenly, something pops up that we never knew we needed or wanted right now but we buy it and you know that impulse social commerce is is a real thing that's kind of taken off and exploded through lockdown uh, once upon a time we used to say we're going shopping and we kind of put our coat on and walk out the front door and now we're just always shopping so it's a great question and people's habits and behaviors in terms of social commerce are, are changing quite rapidly so it's definitely a space we're in I'm sure, um, I'm sure Laura probably wants to add to that because I'm sure that's a space that you are very much in as well. Uh, I would echo exactly what you said there, actually. Um, yeah, I think, I can't, I th as I said earlier, I think it's not too far away. Um, and I think we have to, you know, like that's where people people are playing nowadays and the habits have changed and we need to be there to, to accommodate them. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering that you take a certain type of consumer to do an impulse purchase of a, I don't know, an ID4, but it could happen. <laughs> I think I think that discovery commerce in terms of like, you didn't realise you were not yet ready for an EV, which is what we've all been talking about today. Yeah. And the more we can take away and remove those barriers that are clearly there. And, you know, a bit like the Hyundai work I talked about, if you miss myth bust, and I think a lot of brands are now starting to realise you need to myth bust, that might be enough to trigger someone to think I could. You know, we've got Black Friday, the biggest retail event coming up at the end of uh, you know in, in a few months' time, and that is rapidly you know getting a lot of traction now in the UK. Um, and it's no longer just a day of shopping; it's becoming a week and a month of Black Friday shopping. And you know that's just people looking for good value. You know, value for money deals, um, not necessarily you know discounts, but just they want to know they're getting good value. And I think there's again another huge opportunity to kind of capitalise on that consumer behaviour. The, be the behaviour is going to be there. People are going to be looking out for is this the right time? Is, is this the reason why I should now make the switch? And with so many people that are looking to make the savings and that total cost of ownership um, message, which if we explain it well enough, is definitely there for some people. Um, I, th I think that's another opportunity that perhaps we should be um, helping to explore as the, uh, you know, as, as the rest of this year progresses. Huge opportunity for test drives as well, I guess, the in the impulse space. You know, I guess that's where you'd... you'd sees a lot of consumers that way exactly yeah definitely some of the events that we've done with with um organizations and companies it just takes that one test drive and all of people's kind of worries are gone from that yeah that's that's great to hear really great to hear that evident fantastic um i guess we're gonna start going to wrapping up so i'm just gonna quickly go around the panel again anything else you'd like to add or ask of one another before we, we start to close 
I was just going to give a quick shout out to the tiny football car initiative that Volkswagen did around the Euros because I just think in terms of like it's that kind of thing that that's you know sparks the conversation um, for people that may not have been thinking about you know anything electric for the next few years just and the fact that they had their own accounts for that that car and and the fact that it was so polarizing and divided people I just thought was a really really good example of of ways in which we can start to you know move move the conversation forward. Yeah, definitely. They've actually continued to now run that as well uh, on TikTok. I noticed. It's yeah. a character in it itself. Yeah. Um, uh, it's hugely successful uh, initiative. And, uh, you know, they operated so quickly as well. They were so kind of agile as a, as a marketing team to kind of to get that live and to get that um, active. Um, I think it was the appreciation that actually was it was a character. And you know what? It's, it's a tool in which they could benefit from. Um, and so, yeah, going from strength to strength. Um, but, yeah, no, it's... Uh, it, it gained huge support across the platform, I have to say. I'm sorry, one final thing from me, um, and I really don't want to end on a, on a kind of grim note here, but I think we could, we should really mention the fact that, you know, climate change is, is happening and, you know, we're all seeing more and more in the news about all terrible events happening across the world as a result of climate change. And sadly, uh, I think that, will also be shining a light upon the need to accelerate the movement towards EVs as well. And I think that will be part of what accelerates the conversation too. I think it's such a valid point. And I don't think it is bringing the tone down. I think it's important that, like you said, it's now a, a discussion point. It's a key agenda item. Um, I've been pinged where we're been live and apparently um, World um, EV Day has just been referenced on the floor of the House of Commons by Grant Shapes. So, you know, this is a topic that's getting conversation. Um, it's getting the right discussions. You know, we've had the White House talk about EV Day today. We've had, you know, UK House of, um, House of Commons talk about it as well. Um, I think I've probably thrown the producers who won't have the link uh, that they, oh, there they have, there we go, we've got the link. Um, are we going to see something? Yes, we are. Uh, Mr. Speaker, today is World EV Day, uh, Electric Vehicle Day, and celebrating the EV ownership worldwide right here in the UK as being one of the best places in the world to drive one of them. Our extensive network of 25,000 publicly available charge points uh, means that we have more rapid charges for every 100 miles of key strategic road than any other country in Europe. And We've made real progress with over half a million electric vehicles on our roads. I'm pleased to say that through grants and tax incentives uh, that just last month, one in six cars sold in this country had a plug on the end of it. <laughs> I, love, I love that. We, we couldn't have um, teased that any better um, to get Grant saying that today. And, uh, and I think that's so interesting that, you know, it's probably... A, well hidden myth that the UK is actually leading this. Um, our, again, I'm sorry to keep renting on about research, but the data is so valuable. Uh, we just conducted a thousand um, quant study in the UK on top of the research I mentioned earlier. And uh, we're ahead of consideration against France and Germany. And I think that's quite surprising because we always assume it's our European counterparts that are better than us um, when it comes to EV. But there's 48% of considerers in the UK now considering, or so it's 48% of people buying a car in the next two years are considering EV. And that is ahead of France and Germany. Um, so I think we've got an awful lot to be proud of. You know, collectively, we're making a lot of noise. Consumers are paying attention. As you said, right, Lena, right, the right people, the right government people, the right influencers are talking about it. And we can only make this stronger by having days like today. So, you know, really take my hat off to... The, the Green TV team for, for coming up with this great format. Um, well, I'm going to thank everybody for your time today. Um, it's been a real pleasure to get us all together. Uh, I, I feel like we've, um, this has been a long time coming and it's been a great idea um, to have a social panel. Um, I think as we've proven, there's an awful lot that collectively we can do. So I'm going to thank everybody for for joining today. Um, it's been so interesting to hear from you all. And I think everyone that's been listening or watching either now or as they watch it on Catch Up Later are gonna take some real fascinating insights away. Uh, we've heard so much about harnessing the power of social media um, and how we can help drive EV adoption. So I'm gonna urge all of you now to get on your social media platforms of choice, hopefully that's all of them, um, and show your support for World EV Day to help make today even more impactful than it was last year. 
Let's all collectively use today to really help drive change and push forward sustainable transport. Um, so all I need to say now is just thank you once again for all my lovely guests. Um, thank you for everyone that's watching or will be watching later. And thank you for all the questions that have been coming in. Um, they've really been interesting um, to hear everyone's responses. So enjoy the rest of World EV Day um, and we'll see you again next year. Thank you. <laughs>